Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site, bettingangle.us, a free site. It is a few days after <clears throat> the Errol Spence, Sean Porter fight. Today is Wednesday, October the 2nd, 2019. Let's talk boxing. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now let me open by saying this. Officially the fight's a split decision. I personally believe Errol Spence won the fight by a few rounds. Let me use this opening opportunity here to invite those of you who believe that Sean Porter won this fight or that this fight should have been scored a draw. Let me invite you to leave your comments if you want links to your own videos in the comment section of this video right I want people to understand that in boxing we could all see the same event and come away with different conclusions I understand the performances by both men were exemplary I want to recognize that there is a sizable group of you out there who agree with the judge who had Sean Porter winning the fight by more than one round, right? But that's not the fight I saw. My pre-fight video is still up here. Errol Spence delivered for us, didn't get the KO, but did drop Sean Porter. In any event, Errol Spence wins the fight, right? And let me just say, so you should have done okay gambling at a minimum. You should have won money on the Errol Spence to win portion of your bet, right? Let me just say this, style-wise, because Styles made this fight. There's a mismatch in one aspect of the fight. In my opinion, deep in the pocket, Errol Spence had a clear edge. Right? Spence is not a mid-range hooker, he's short range. Right? He shifts his body like Rocky Marciano. Understand what we mean by short range. I'm talking about not a Danny Garcia distance, where the other guy is about an arm's length away. I'm talking about when the guys are in the trenches, leaning on each other. Errol Spence is throwing the straighter punches. Errol Spence is throwing the harder punches. Errol Spence knows how when the fighters are practically leaning on each other. Spence knows how to keep you in place. He has the skills of a deep in the pocket fighter. He knows how to keep you in place so he can land big shots without you returning fire. So it's to me the most telling part of this fight. In the 11th round and by then I thought Spence had already won the fight. But in the 11th round let's revisit the knockdown. Right now, just like basketball players, just like James Harden wants you in a certain place and things look happenstance and then Harden will bounce into you. Then take a step back, right? We'll, we'll say two steps. I know some people will say more than two steps, but just like Harden will then take two steps back and then we'll hit the three and then will stick his legs out so that as you run to block the three you foul him. I know the NBA has changed the rules but understand that's a formula that Harden's using that if you see it the first time you think oh you know Harden bumped into the guy by accident right there at that point on the floor by accident by coincidence. Right? Harden had his legs out just by chance. The defender ran into him 
going for the ball, and it was unexpected. Right? You know better once you watch Harden for longer than five minutes. Well, in the 11th round of this fight, the punch that drops Sean Porter. Spence is a southpaw. It's a left hand. What I want you to do in looking at the film is look at Spence's right hand. This is what fighters who fight inside do. Whether it's Roberto Duran, whether it's Andre Ward. Understand, this is almost straight out of the Lennox Lewis-Michael Grant fight. Somehow, by chance, by coincidence, Sean Porter does not have the opportunity to move his head up out of the way of Spence's left hook because Spence's right hand just happens to be on the back of Sean Porter's neck. Right? Understand, in real time, it looks like it just happens to be there. Right? Oh, the guys got tangled up by chance. Spence has Porter locked in place for the left hand that drops him. I understand. In boxing, we don't allow you to hold a guy behind the head so that you can hit him with your other hand. But let me just tell you, that's the world that short-range punchers live in. Folks, that's what it means to fight deep in the pocket. Right? The occasional punch that strays low. Right? I'm sure Andre Ward didn't intend to hit Kovalev below the belt multiple times in the last round of their last fight. Right? The pinning of a guy's hand with an elbow. Right? The grappling that went on, let's say, between Rocky Marciano and Jersey Joe Walcott in their first fight before Marciano takes his title in a fight Marciano is losing by throwing a very short right hand. Right? I'm just telling you, it's a language. Right? It's not all fouling, but it's a way to pin a guy and to prevent the guy from throwing back. It's a way to pin a guy and to have him unable to move out of the way of your punches. You want another example? How about faster, more fluid, future Hall of Famer Sugar Ray Leonard in the first fight against Duran. How is slower footed Duran roughing up Leonard to that extent? repeatedly on the inside. You notice when they're on the inside, Leonard needed more space to throw punches. This is a guy with much faster hands than Duran. Somehow Duran seemed to always neutralize one of his hands and go to work. You want to know the tip-off on the inside fighting, besides the fact that Spence, and it's magnificent, folks, it's a great moment in boxing, right, is able to land that left hand with ferocity while somehow having his right hand behind Porter's neck. You want to know the tip-off on who's better inside? Look at Spence's upper body inside and how he defends it. Understand, Errol Spence is taller than Sean Porter. Right? They get inside, you would imagine Porter would have an advantage. Porter would just physically be able to get lower than Errol Spence. Right, would be able, deep in the pocket, to riddle Spence's body. Right, Spence has more of an upper body to hide. But that's not what happens, is it? When they get in deep in the pocket, Spence's upper body is like an accordion. You'll notice that Spence is able to bend his upper body. This is while maintaining offensive supremacy. He's landing more shots than Sean Porter. 
while maintaining an offensive game. You're going to notice that Spence realizes, because Spence knows Porter, that Porter's shots are wider than Errol Spence's. So Spence realizes that Porter has to deepen the pocket, has to try to straighten out his shots, but is likely to throw shots that hit Spence outside the shoulders. So Spence, of course, has his body like this. And Spence, who's a slugger, who's a KO artist, whose catchphrase is man down, Spence, deep in the pocket, has defensive skills. Dare I say, he has advanced defensive skills. He can hide his upper body deep in the pocket. Sean Porter, there are times where Porter is able to get off right hands up top on Errol Spence. I'm sure looking at the video, Spence is going to say to himself, you know, I should have just tucked my head behind my shoulder there. Right? But understand, Spence's body, Spence is not getting hit in the stomach or solar plexus that much. This is while Spence is targeting Porter's body. So what you have here is a bit of an optical illusion, just like you do when James Harden, by coincidence, has his legs out and is getting run into by his defender. Right? You have Errol Spence, who is a slugger with dramatic highlights, who takes out guys, who hunts down guys, who will. Kel Brook, Chris Algieri. You have him lulling Sean Porter, and that's the word, lulling Sean Porter, into fighting him deep in the pocket where Errol Spence has the biggest advantage of the fight. The takeaway I have from this fight is simply, look, if you're fighting Errol Spence, you need a mobile pocket. You can't have a pocket where Errol Spence is able to then start playing chess and then start figuring out how to throw right hands that just happen to linger so that your head is right here so he can come across with his dominant hand, his left hand, on hooks. Right? Spence, the taller fighter, isn't even more vulnerable to the body. The pocket hurts you. This is Marvin Hagler deep in the pocket. So what I want people to do is I want people to revisit here just for style purposes Hagler Leonard, right? Understand, Ray Leonard, a guy with blinding hand speed, right? Uh, I believe a greater than 60% KO ratio, career, heavy puncher, right? Deceptively looks like a pretty boy, is actually a heavy puncher, right? A guy who later in life drops light heavyweight champion Donnie Lalonde. Right here you have Ray Leonard who understood. He understood. He could not stand in front of Marvin Hagler. He just couldn't. If he was there, he had to tie up Marvin Hagler. Right? Ray's strategy in that fight was to move for two and a half minutes of every round. Right? Couldn't allow a pocket to be set up. He had to move for two and a half minutes. Then in the last 30 seconds, Ray would let his hands go. Right? The idea was that Hagler was trying to set up a pocket. Hagler, short puncher like Errol Spence. So you have those scenes where Ray Leonard is, you know, flurrying at the end of a round and moving away and stuff like that. The problem is, Sean Porter is not built to flurry like that. Also, Ray Leonard, big-time puncher. Right? Sean Porter, not a big-time puncher. So Sean Porter, while he's circling Errol Spence, doesn't have Spence's jab. 
which is exemplary. The thing with Spence is he's the race car where you look under the hood and you say, wow, this guy has more horsepower than I thought. Right? Porter doesn't have the Larry Holmes jab. Right? Porter couldn't circle Spence. Set up a moving pocket because a stationary pocket doesn't work against a guy who's a short range guy. Right? Porter couldn't set up a moving pocket, keep Spence turning. Keep Spence resetting, right, while hurting Spence. Porter just doesn't have that level of jab. Porter doesn't have that level of power. Porter doesn't have that level of hand speed, right? So what you have is Porter who's a warrior. He's as much a warrior as Errol Spence. But to me, he doesn't have the Spence skill set deep in the pocket where this fight ended up in the later rounds. Right? If you're going to beat Spence, you have to get Spence in transition. In other words, you can't have a defined pocket where Errol Spence is able to collapse his body so you can't hit him right inside and then is able to riddle you with an inside game where he knows he has the harder punches inside. Right? Understand, guys who live inside like this, they know how to shift weight. Their punches can be incredibly short. They also know right how to pin parts of your body so you can't move your head out the way. Right? That right hand somehow Spence has an elbow in there. Somehow Spence has a forearm in there. Right? It becomes a pseudo wrestling match which is what a short range hooker wants. Because at short range, understand, Porter couldn't hurt Spence like Spence hurt Porter. Porter's best punches to me are punches where he's able to lean back. There's a little break. Then he gets off a great right hand. Up top on Errol Spence. But you understood when it came to the body. You understood deep in the pocket. Errol Spence had the advantage. So, let's just jump outside this fight for a second. I feel Manny Pacquiao is going to be a live underdog against Errol Spence. Simply because, number one, Pacquiao hits harder than Sean Porter. Right? Porter is sudden like Pacquiao. But Pacquiao, to me, hits harder than Sean Porter and is more efficient with his footwork. In other words, that Ugas fight's disturbing because while Sean Porter's moving around a lot in that fight, he's moving around too much. There doesn't seem to be a purpose attached to the movement. With Manny Pacquiao, by contrast, Manny Pacquiao, especially now, in his 40s, has the footwork down to a science. Right? So in the moments before Pacquiao drops Keith Thurman, you'll notice he has Keith Thurman backing up. Right? That's what you need to do with Errol Spence. You need to get Errol Spence out of his comfort zone. Errol Spence with a defined pocket that he's able to go deep inside of. So he's leaning on you as these guys are in this fight. Right? So he's leaning on you. That's Errol Spence at home. That's Errol Spence in his living room with the slippers off and his feet up on the, you know, table. Right? That's Errol Spence with the TV remote in his hand and a bag of popcorn next to him. That's Errol Spence in his comfort zone. 
You can't have a defined pocket against Errol Spence where Errol Spence gets an opportunity to be comfortable. The Kell Brook fight's interesting. Kell Brook comes in on Errol Spence. I thought Errol Spence was surprised by Kell Brook's power. Kell Brook hits harder than Sean Porter. Right? Kell Brook's hand speed. Kell Brook is blindingly fast in terms of hand speed. Right? And just Kell Brook's two-handed attack. So early in that fight, I thought Errol Spence gets thrown off his game. He's not in the living room on the sofa. Right? I thought... I thought... Kell Brook surprised him. Comes in, is hitting him, and... You know, Spence is a hunter. Spence wants to actually, you know, hunt you down. I thought Kell Brook got Spence on his back foot. Surprise Spence. Right? The Mikey Garcia fight... Spence flashes a jab. Right? Mikey wants to get Spence on his back foot, wants to get Spence in transition. Spence does a Larry Holmes. He says, look, you got to get by this jab first before this fight starts. Right? Spence, again, there's more to him than meets the eye. But understand, later in that Mikey Garcia fight, you get the pocket being formed. But by then, Mikey has been bludgeoned by Spence's jab. If Spence flicks his shoulder, Mikey is nervous. Well, this fight, you have Sean Porter wanting to get inside. I'm not sure if I understood the Sean Porter game plan here. Right? Porter starts by being outside and moving a bit. You thought, okay, is, is he going to be able to set up a movable pocket? Well, in the later rounds, Porter then wants to get inside. Wants to turn this into a war of attrition. I believe the happiest person in the room at that point was Errol Spence. You have a shorter man who doesn't have Spence's power deep in the pocket. Wanting to fight Spence deep in the pocket where Spence is king. Spence is able to lean on him. Spence is able to lean him into shots. Right? Spence's body work is masterful. Right? Spence is hiding his body. Right? He has his body like an accordion. I thought Porter, quite frankly, fell into Spence's trap. Now let me say, the master technician in the division, who I'm sure was taking notes watching this fight, a guy who set up a mobile pocket against Amir Khan. Terence Crawford has to be licking his lips thinking about fighting Errol Spence. I think that's another great fight. Let's just say Errol Spence, in my opinion, has two great fights sitting in front of him. And let's be clear here. The sanctioning body should not matter. In other words, Pacquiao has a title, Crawford has a title. More importantly, we the public know who Pacquiao and um, Crawford are. Right? So if I'm Errol Spence and Spence just picked up another belt, Spence is unified, okay, great. But if I'm Errol Spence, if one of these sanctioning bodies jumps out of the bushes and says to me, hey, you need to fight this no-name guy, before you fight Pacquiao and Porter. If I'm Spence, I say, look, man, here's your title back. Public knows who I am. I'm unbeaten. Right? The public will understand why I want to fight Pacquiao and Crawford. Right? It's because, quite frankly, legacy matters more than the belt at the moment. Let me also point out, too, a guy like Errol Spence who trains with heavier guys. Doesn't he train with Jamel Charlo? People like that? A guy like Errol Spence, who is in his late 20s, has to realize, just like Callum Smith at 168 has to realize, that you're only young once. 
right? He's going to gain weight, folks. He's going to graduate to the 154-pound class, the 160-pound class. So in the limited time that Errol Spence has left at 147 pounds, go for the legacy. Right? Manny Pacquiao is a living legend. He's multi-generational. Right? Many of Pacquiao's biggest fights were against guys who have been retired now for years. Think about it. El Terrible, Eric Morales. Right? Marquez, who's eligible for the Hall of Fame. Right? Cotto. These guys are out of the game. Margarito. That's how long Pacquiao's been at it. Oscar De La Hoya is a statesman now in boxing. He's one of boxing's premier promoters, has been for years. He's one of Pacquiao's biggest opponents. So quite frankly, the Pacquiao opportunity is a historical opportunity, and dare I say, and I know Sean Porter has sparred with Manny Pacquiao, but because of Pacquiao's punching power, because of Pacquiao's ability to keep an opponent moving, right? Because of those factors, because I don't believe Pacquiao is going to decide later in the fight, okay, let's lean on each other, especially after the Jeff Horn debacle. I'm going to allow Errol Spence to lean on me, and we're going to make this a war of attrition deep in the pocket. Because I don't think Pacquiao's going to think that way. Right? I think that's a legendary fight. And let's face it, Terrence Crawford, Crawford might be the gold standard in the entire sport. Right? I see Lomachenko. And every fight, Loma's trying to outhand speed you and get inside on you and turn you, right? I can't say that about Crawford, can I? Crawford has something in common with Bill Belichick, right? He's the New England Patriots of boxing, isn't he? You look at Crawford fights, Crawford's a different person every fight. Right, if you're looking at a Crawford fight, you have to ask yourself, who is Terrence Crawford going to be tonight? And then you see Crawford out there moving against Amir Khan, setting traps and stuff like that. And you realize, okay, not only can Crawford change styles every fight, but he can actually do so while fighting world-class opposition. How does that happen? I'm guessing of all the people out there in the world, the person who knows the most about the need to keep Errol Spence in transition, to not allow Errol Spence to hunt you down, to not allow Errol Spence to set up behind a jab, to not allow Errol Spence to lean on you, to not allow Errol Spence to get so comfortable that his right hand is able to get behind your neck while he throws a left hook. Of all the people out there, I'm sure Terrence Crawford has the most detailed notes. So with all due respect to the large number of very credible opponents at welterweight, right, Danny Garcia, Keith Thurman, who's only lost once, folks, Right? Countless others. The young guys on the way up. As I see it, Errol Spence has two more fights left in the division. Manny Pacquiao, a fight in which I'll be betting on Pacquiao. I'll hedge it with Spence by KO. But I'll be betting on Pacquiao. Right? And Terrence Crawford. And in that fight, I might be betting on Terrence Crawford. Right here, I thought... Sean Porter, who showed a lot of heart. Sean Porter is one of my favorite fighters, has been great to me from a betting perspective. Right? There are many fights that looked vague and ambiguous before the fight. Sean Porter, Adrian Porter, where Porter delivered. Right? But Sean Porter 
just was not able to set up a mobile pocket. Made the mistake of trying to outwill Errol Spence. Right? This wasn't a will fight, folks. This is a skill fight. Both guys have a lot of heart. Both guys were determined to give their best performance. Right? It's a noteworthy fight. Excellent fight. But on the inside, Spence's skill advantage took over. This was James Harden bouncing into you with a shoulder, taking two steps, we'll limit it to two steps, taking two steps back, draining a three, then keeping his legs out while you ran into them. Right? That's the dynamic Errol Spence set up here. And it worked. Sean Porter was right in front of him. That's where Errol Spence wants you. Short range hooker, master inside. Much better than we realize. Great defensively inside. Certainly better defensively inside than Sean Porter. Right? Taller man who somehow, somehow negated that height disadvantage. And it's a disadvantage when you have an opponent with as much heart, courage, moxie as Sean Porter who's coming in trying to land shots. Somehow Errol Spence hides his body. Think about that. Right? I thought the 11th round was interesting. Because Sean Porter mounts an attack, but you notice for all the movement that Sean Porter has, he's not landing meaningful body punches. Right? Errol Spence is just, to me, a bit more skilled deep in the pocket than Sean Porter. Porter, in my opinion, needed to take this fight outside of the pocket and needed to move the pocket. Have Errol Spence looking for him. Right? Come in with straight shots. Porter lands some beautiful straight right hands late in this fight. The problem was after landing the right hand, rather than back away and say, okay, Errol, the judges just saw me land a great right hand on you. What's your response going to be? Come find me. And as you're, you know, as Spence is moving forward, then Porter could pivot, jump back in at different angles. Rather than do this like Manny Pacquiao would have done this, Porter tried to stay deep in the pocket. I thought that cost him the fight. Let me hear from you. Give me your thoughts. I especially want to hear from the Sean Porter crowd. Understand, while this was a split decision, all of the judges had this fight with a multi-round winner. Right? The two judges who had Errol Spence winning this fight have him winning it by more than one round. Right? In the press, they tried to sell it as the knockdown being the difference in the fight. Really? That knockdown doesn't come till the 11th round. I thought Porter, excuse me, I thought Spence had the fight the way he wanted it before then. Right? Give us your thoughts. Tell us your scorecard. Tell us what Porter could have done to win this fight. I believe he needed a mobile pocket. I don't think Porter has the punching power of a uh, Kell Brook, right? I think he needed to move a little bit. I, fe I think he needed to have a short-range hooker having to deal at mid to long range, knowing that Porter has more head movement and elusiveness than Mikey Garcia. Porter was not going to get hit with Spence's jab. So I feel Porter needed to be further away from Spence, moving his upper body, and needed to continue to circle Spence the entire fight. I don't believe Spence is an opponent who you can set up shop against. You shouldn't be close enough to Spence where Spence can hit you with short hooks. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. Thanks for stopping by.